Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Jordan Rudder, Director of Communications at American Bird Conservancy. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel afterward. We'll be putting the links referenced in the chat, but in case you miss them or can't copy them down fast enough, please know that everything can be found in a follow-up email we'll send to registrants and on our website. Please submit any questions you have during the presentations during uh, using the Q&A box. We'll try to answer as many of those as we can during the Q&A portion at the end of the conversation. We will also be answering some of those questions as we go. Automated captions are available for this webinar and you can turn them on by clicking on the up arrow next to the CC icon, then clicking on show subtitles. You'll be able to drag them wherever you want on the screen. Before we begin, I wanted to share some background information. American Bird Conservancy, shortened to ABC, was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds and their habitats across the Americas. We continue that work today following a conservation strategy outlined by the pyramid featured on the current slide. Our work strives to help keep common birds common and prevent the rare species from going extinct. Bird conservation works. Species and groups of birds have rebounded in the past decades, but it doesn't happen without people like you who care about birds. So thank you again for joining our webinar today. As I just mentioned, bird conservation takes people. It takes dedicated and caring individuals coming together to make a difference for these animals that we love so much. At American Bird Conservancy, we celebrate the diversity of birds and the diversity of people. We are inspired by our partners and our staff, and we intend to work more explicitly toward advancing justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. One of the ways that we're doing that is through our Conservation and Justice Fellowship Program. Our, part, our paid part-time fellowships allow individuals with a wide range of backgrounds and expertise to work closely with our staff and partners on understanding how bird conservation efforts can support local communities, ensure the consideration of varied perspectives, and engage more people. So without further ado, let me introduce you to this year's fellows. We'll get started with our four fellows who were not able to join us today. And please note that the bird paintings next to the fellows were created by our resident artist, Swapna Shepherd, whom you'll learn about in a minute. First up though, we have Ellen Sanders Regasso, who was our Indigenous Partnerships Fellow. Next, we have Noah Gomes, our Polina Fellow in Hawaii. We had Katia Pilar Carranza, our Grassland Stewardship Fellow. And we had Barb Capreos, our Climate Justice Fellow. The four fellows that will be speaking today include Swapna Shepherd, who is a wildlife conservation artist working to raise awareness of the impact that habitat loss and other human activities have on the Earth's biodiversity and unique ecosystems. She believes that art is an important visual expression of the natural world that can help bring wider attention to environmental justice and conservation. Throughout this introduction, again, please note that this is her artwork that she's done as part of her fellowship here. Next, we have Claudia Santiago, who has a master's degree in geophysics and a master's in rhetoric from the University of Texas at El Paso. She aspires to use her experiences across disciplines to promote the contributions of underrepresented communities to science and facilitate science literacy. We also have Harrison Watson, who is a PhD candidate in ecology and evolution biology at Princeton University, studying the interaction between biodiversity loss and climate change in Sub-Saharan Africa. He is also a Public Voices Fellow with the Yale Program for Climate Change Communication and the Op-Ed Project, and occasionally gardens with his family. Javier Roman Nevias is a Puerto Rican artist, writer, and naturalist. He holds a master's degree in architecture from the University of Puerto Rico and another in environmental management from the Yale School of the Environment. Javier combines his design background with human ecology and ecosystem conservation into a practice between environmental communications and land management. And last but not least, we have Namo De Silva. She'll be our panel moderator, and she leads work on Together for Birds at American Bird Conservancy. Advocating for the well being of birds and people, she periodically teaches environmental justice at George Washington University and dabbles in storytelling. Namo was born in Sri Lanka, grew up in Washington, D.C., and cares deeply about community, wild beings, and places, history, and cities. Namo, I'm going to invite you back on screen now. Welcome. 
Thanks so much, Jordan. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome, everyone. Hi, Neha. I see you in the chat. Um, welcome. It's good to see everyone. Neha Misra created the banner image that we've been using for the fellowships, um, and it's a pleasure to see her here. Um, it is a great honor to introduce and talk with our first ever group of conservation and justice fellows. Um, half the group is here today. We hope to feature some of the perspectives of the remaining fellows in future webinars and especially through their written blog posts, which will be coming out over the next few months. Um, so to get us started, I'm going to set the stage a little bit, tell you a little bit about how these um, conservation and justice fellowships came about. I'm going to read three quotes to you that I find illustrative and inspiring. And then we're going to go around. Um, I'm going to ask the, a few questions of each of the fellows. We'll also have time, hopefully, at the end for some of your questions. Um, please put those in the Q&A box. Um, and for a question submitted by some of you uh, when you register. So let's get going. Um, basically, my first decade uh, in the environmental field was spent doing um, threatened species work and figuring out what places needed to be protected. And I did this in an international context. But it was really lonely work. And because it was lonely, I kept thinking about how do we get more people engaged? How do we get a greater diversity of people engaged? Um, and that set off about a decade of trying to figure that out. And these are three quotes that I think helped me in as they helped describe the process I was thinking about. Um, the first quote is by Dr. Drew Lanham, and it's about the connections between science and story. A lot of environmental work, a lot of work around species extinction, climate change, it, it's grounded in very strong science, and that science is important. Um, but this is what Dr. Lanham writes in his book, The Home Place. My colleagues and I have mostly done a poor job of reaching the hearts and minds of those who don't hold advanced degrees with an ology at the end. We take a multidimensional array of creatures, places, and interwoven lives and boil them down into the flat pages and prose of obscure journals most will never read. Those tomes are important, but the sin is in leaving the words to die there, pressed between the pages. As knowledge molders in the stacks and the public, as knowledge molders in the stacks, the public goes on largely uninformed about the wild beings and places that should matter to all of us. Um, that is a lot of what I was thinking about as I was still in the field of biodiversity conservation. Um, I shifted for a time to do a doctorate in education. And during that time, I was very much inspired by the work of Dr. Richard Louvre on um, No Child Left Inside and the Nature Principle. And this is a quote from him. We have such a brief opportunity to pass on to our children our love for this earth and to tell our stories. These are the moments when the world is made whole. That, that to me captures the idea of passing on not just information to the next generation, but also our sense of wonder, our love for the natural world, our the why. Why do we care about birds? Why do we care about wild places? What, what matters? And then I'll leave, uh, I'll end this bit with a quote from Dr. Wangari Matai who I had the honor of uh, being taught by when I was in graduate school. Um, Today, we are faced with a challenge that calls for a shift in our thinking so that humanity stops threatening its life support system. We are called to assist the earth to heal her wounds and in the process, heal our own. Indeed, to embrace the whole of creation in all its diversity, beauty, and wonder. Recognizing that sustainable development democracy and peace are indivisible is an idea whose time has come. And that's Dr. Wangari Matai. Um, There's so many others who, who've inspired my own journey towards these fellowships, but um, many of those people are within American Bird Conservancy. Over the last, um, since the end of 2019, I've been working with ABC and then at ABC since the middle of 2021. Um, currently serving as Chief Diversity Officer. We came to developing the fellowships in the summer and fall of October. Um, 
uh, summer and fall of 2022. Um, so no, is that right? No, summer and fall of 2021. Um, and then we we recruited fellows in the spring of 2021. And why we believe that this is such an important solution is that these fellowships, in my opinion, um, they're investments in people's ideas, their stories, and their perspectives. Um, we're investing, when you think about fellowships, they are a step in a person's career or their career path or their, their professional journey. And so in a sense, each of these positions that an individual holds is part of their lifetime contribution to conservation, to social justice, to education, um, whatever the field, you're investing in people. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, so as I was mulling all this over this morning, I, I wrote, just a little something, and I'll re read that to you now. At the intersections between bird extinction, human oppression, and environmental degradation are struggles so vast and deep that the easiest thing to lose is hope. It is in such darkness that we're, we most need bird song, wild places, art, music, stories, and community to remind us what we are fighting for and to help us understand that we're not alone. I personally need constant reminders. The fellowships, as I was saying, were, are intended to recognize and invest in the lifetime contributions of individuals and to honor their relationships, their networks, and their ways of knowing. The um, work that our first group of fellows has completed was carried out part-time. Um, that's what Jordan mentioned in the beginning. It was just 10 to 12 hours a week. Um, for six months, and then they they spent some additional time finishing up their projects and writing about what 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 happened during that time. Um, but what they're doing really is creating openings and contributing ideas and starting conversations that we at ABC intend to carry forward and and also circle back to over time. Future groups of fellows will hopefully add their own perspectives and research and seed grants and continuation awards may enable us to explore connected ideas or to dig deeper. Um, I'm gonna stop talking now and start asking a few questions. Um, could the fellows come back on screen? Hi everyone. I'm gonna start with asking a few questions about um, who you are, what you, how, what brought you to our fellowship program, and then we'll move on to some of the insights from the projects themselves. Um, Claudia, if you don't mind, I will begin with you. Um, could you describe uh, just a little bit about your background, um, your professional journey, and just very briefly, what brought you to this fellowship program? And then I'll ask the rest of the fellows the same question. Um, so I started in science um, since I was a freshman in college. Um, I got a Gates Millennium Scholarship, um, so that got pay, pay my education in physics. And then um, during that time, I started doing astrophysics and just exploring. And I decided that through astrophysics, the knowledge that I gained to that, I, I saw how unique the Earth is and the processes. So that led me to get a master's in geophysics. Um, but I think once I was in geophysics, um, I felt a need to make sure that what I was producing as a scientist um, had an impact in unrepresented communities. Um, because that was part of my, growing up, uh, I was part of a, a community that was marginalized. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I was given this opportunity and that scholarship to complete my education. And I wanted to make sure that I was making an impact outside of science. Um, so that led me to get a master's degree in rhetoric and writing studies at uh, UTEP, the University of Texas at El Paso. Um, and that just opened up a whole new world of uh, research. Um, I have done a lot of work, uh, science communication, and um, kind of like intersection between uh, environmental science and geophysics and science communication. Um, I worked in the National Park Service for five years. And then I recently moved to the Environmental Protection Agency as a physical scientist. Um, so that's 
kind of how my career has gone. Um, and to this day, I'm still very much in the intersection between being a scientist and trying to do outreach and making sure that the benefits of science reach uh, communities, but specifically unrepresented communities. Um, why did I apply for this uh, fellowship? Um, because I think growing up, uh, coming from an immigrant family, um, I feel like I, I grew up with my heritage and knowledge of uh, my ancestors, but um, especially going into physics, um, I was very distant from the experience of uh, indigenous women in Latin America. So even though that's my heritage, and I always, you know, people recognize that, like they always ask me, are you from, from uh, uh, India or are you from, from uh, Mexico City or are you, where are you from? So it's clear that when people see me, they have ideas, are you from Peru or are you from the Philippines? Um, but at the same time, I didn't have knowledge of uh, what women in Latin America, where my heritage is from, is experiencing right now. Like I, I know what my mom tells me about when she grew up in Mexico City, what it was like for her to be a woman in Latin America, but I didn't have any personal experiences or any knowledge. Um, so when I saw the description for my project that um, I'm doing or that I completed about gender equality in Latin America, um, I saw it as an opportunity to connect um, some of, uh, with some of that, like just uh, knowing what are women in Latin America facing right now um, and making a difference, um, I think, kind of giving back, I feel like so I'm very lucky that I have an education and um, I was given opportunities. So just trying to give people or giving my heritage and um, that my communities that I haven't been in touch with, um, you know, support them in some way. Thank you, Claudia. And I think one of the things that your project illustrates so well is that the, the conditions that enable um, birds to thrive and that enable women and people in general to thrive are, are different and the obstacles that people face are different from place to place. So when you're thinking even about women's participation in protected area conservation or site conservation or bird conservation, what, what the issues are vary from country to country and, and even within a country from geography to geography. And so your project is a big one in that sense, it covering a whole region. Um, and we'll go into that a little bit more later. But um, next, I think I'd like to go to Javier um, to get just a little sense of your journey, um, what brought you to the fellowship, um, and, and yeah, to the specific project that you researched as well. Thank you. Thank you, Namal. And thank you all for being here uh, to begin with and for your interest in, in what we've done. Um, this has been a great opportunity, um, and I'm very thankful for it. It's been awesome uh, from the beginning all the way to now. Um, I, besides my credentials, I'm from Puerto Rico, so uh, hola a todo el mundo. Um, I was born and raised there, but I'm a colonial subject of the United States, and that's why I speak English this way. <laughs> People always ask me at some point, but where are you from? Um, so I'm, I'm a white passing Puerto Rican. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, they, them, whichever, whichever you guys uh, prefer to use. And I'm, I'm based in the unceded lands of the Olone people and otherwise known as Oakland, California. And here I do land justice work in the context of the state's apologies to indigenous peoples for, for, the, geno for the California genocide and the policies that have been put in place by the state to basically return indigenous lands back to their original stewards. Um, so I worked in that and in um, uh, land tenure for farmers of color, which has been historically excluded from owning land and from access to land, both in the United States and in California in particular. And that's where I'm at. Um, I, I applied to the fellowship because uh, I, I left Yale very uh, disenchanted with conservation as a whole because of its history. Uh, Yale is where the 
the eugenesis that created the national park systems uh, kind of started off there and that's cool. So I discovered all that history and the history of genocide against ind indigenous peoples and displacement. And um, the work that I had done with birds was in urban, urban ornithology um, and the chance to to help with my own perspective uh, and uh, the Birds Bird City project with, uh, with ABC was a chance to give it give it a try again and, uh, and and contribute somehow to bird conservation in urban settings. So that basically sums a lar a long story short. Thank you, Javier. I think that that one of the things that this journey that you mentioned um, highlights for me is just the complexity of histories of place, of um, why birds are going extinct, um, why birds are in decline, what land use practices have led to uh, that loss, um, and what behaviors can contribute to a better, more holistic relationships with, with birds, with history, with place, with each other um, in the future. And I think the Bird City Network provides us with opportunities to think about all of those things if we pay attention to them. Um, from, from Javier, I'm going to move on to Harrison um, to talk about what brought you to this work, to this place, um, to the specific project that you've been working on. Yeah, uh, likewise, thank you all so much um, for giving me the opportunity to be here. Welcome to all the participants. Uh, I come from the deep south broadly speaking was born in atlanta and then moved across or went to school across you know the four states between atlanta and louisiana so very familiar with the black belt um i went to school at a historically black college uh jackson state university in jackson mississippi um i came from or at least my interests in science and and science adjacent work came more so from uh, an interest in bridging the perceived schism, I'll say, between religion and science or the institutions of religion and science. Um, and the way in which I found that I was most interested in doing that uh, in, in my undergrad studies was with scientific storytelling or with environmental storytelling. So I found out about this fellowship through a group called Planet Forward based out of George Washington University in Washington, DC. Um, where I did a couple of stories or a couple of pieces um, and just sort of relating uh, work in environmentalism and concepts in green infrastructure and things like that to the Black, but broadly speaking, minority communities of all different genders, of all different ethnicities, of all different economic groups, and just sort of trying to figure out, you know, how we can get along together, um, get along from the standpoint of a book that I have returned to um, just this last week, staying with the troublemaking Ken in the Thulu scene um, from Donna Haraway, and just sort of figuring out how we can, you know, create a a language, so to speak, a transdis transdisciplinary language that blends, as you were mentioning earlier, Namal, um, arts and sciences and journalistic discourse, the humanities and histories. Um, and a diverse suite of languages that allow us to figure out how we can get along with the planet um, or with uh, multi-species groups, non-human species groups on the planet. And so for me, uh, did not mention this, but one summer I did research out at Berkeley looking at the effects of pesticides and other chemical wastes on specifically frogs, um, but also other amphibian species. Um, with Professor Tyrone Hayes, that was a very instrumental experience for me. Um, and you know, for the last five years or four years leading up to applying for the fellowship, uh, was um, hearing a lot of rumblings about the effects of pesticides um, on farm workers in, in California, where a lot of my research with the group was based for that summer, um, but never had the opportunity to engage with it fully, and so made sort of almost, it was it was just this, I guess, like unconscious thing to at least throw my hat in the ring to see about participating in this project or this fellowship. And the project um, has been in many ways 
Uh, and we can dive into this more afterwards. I won't take up any more swap in this time, but I will end by saying that this project or this fellowship has been in many ways instrumental in allowing me to connect the scientific experience that I've had through undergrad and my graduate studies towards that ultimate goal of trying to figure out how we can, how I can contribute um, to these multi-species conversations. So yeah, thank you again. Thank you, Harrison. And Swapna, um, I, you, your fellowship project is very different from the others, which are very much about community engagement and research um, into social justice issues or human well-being issues in relation to bird conservation. But yours is an artist residency and it is definitely um, the most different for ABC, um, I think, of, of these fellowships that I strongly believed and we strongly believed at the beginning of this program that we need multiple ways of helping us understand and love birds and, to, uh, and ways to illustrate all of this different work that we're trying to accomplish. Um, so Swapna, could you tell me a bit about your background and what brought you to the artist residency? Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks to Namal, uh, Jordan, Erica, and also all the other supervisors and fellows who took time out to help in my project because it was basically a representation of their uh, work. And so they, each one of them has taken time out to uh, speak one uh, speak one on one, one, one with me, uh, the fellows that is, and then the fellow, uh, the supervisors uh, who were not even involved in my project, they have helped me out, uh, 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 contacted me via email. And also I'm very thankful for that. Uh, that helped me a lot. Uh, understanding uh, all the different aspects of this fellowship. Um, I am a, a wildlife and conservation artist. I am based in Austin, Texas, uh, but I'm originally from uh, Pune, the western state of India. Um, as far as education, I have a master's in environmental science from uh, Pune University. Um, I have done uh, everything <laughs> with my art from um, portraits, commission portraits for uh, people and uh, horses because I live in the hill country in Texas and uh, I'm surrounded by ranches. Uh, but, and in the beginning it went even having a master's in environmental science, it was not clear to me how uh, my art fit in because that's my love. And uh, I didn't know how it fit in, but it slowly uh, became clearer uh, as uh, with different experiences. For example, I had a chance to visit the Tambopata region in um, Peru. And uh, so uh, that was wonderful. I had uh, plenty of uh, uh, experience sketching over there and photographs of the species, which when I returned back home uh, became large oil paintings. And um, so I put these together to form, uh, which I called the Far Into the Amazon series um, for endangered species. So this is what I've done in the past few years. I have dedicated my art practice to just endangered species. And so, um, so those are the paintings for the far into the Amazon. It has uh, everything from the highlands uh, where uh, Waikecha Research Station, I got to visit that. And um, I was able to paint and sketch uh, the Arasari Tucanets, uh, then to the hyacinth macaw found in Brazil, and then uh, also the uh, Amazon manatees. Uh, but also uh, during the fellowship, I was I I also love the immediacy of watercolors and was able to explore it much further uh, with the fellowship. Um, as far as uh, why I applied to the ABC fellowship is first of all ABC's core mission of birds, and the fellowship connected uh, birds with um, conservation and diversity and equity all of which resonated with me deeply because of uh, my experience with um, uh, different tribes in India that are involved in environmental conservation. And, um, you know, uh, hearing people's voices in different languages. Uh, just a fun fact, my own uh, mother tongue of Marathi has 42 dialects. So there's a, <laughs> there's, you know, a diversity right there, even in the small place that I come from. So this de deeply resonated with me and it, it turned out to be a very, very enriching experience. 
Thank you, Swapna. Um, th that's a good moment to mention just the importance of Indigenous caretakers in, in conserving biodiversity. Uh, there's huge overlap between biological diversity and human cultural diversity. Um, and, and also where cultural diversity is lost, biological diversity is generally lost as well. And, and I think one of the most important ways forward is to try to reconnect and reestablish those types of that diversity and that flourishing, both for people and, and for biodiversity. And I, I love the, the possibilities inherent in a fellowship program like this to explore different, different places from different perspectives, um, whether it's art or religion or history, um, all those different ways of knowing. And the fellowship program, the fellowships overall, um, we had a group of fellows for 2022. We'll have another group in 2024. They're all, the overall program is open to anyone. Um, you do have to be over 21. That's the only restriction um, beyond an interest or expertise in environmental work, in birds, or in um, some aspect of human well being, education, social justice. Um, the, the requirements were very broad, and yet we got this group of really talented fellows. Um, I'd like to move on to asking each of you for just one key insight or takeaway from, from the research or community engagement work you did, or from, from the process of the art in your case, Swapna. Um, this time, I'm going to start with Harrison. Yeah, so I think, in brief, one of the biggest takeaways for me was and following up on that, you know, um, rumbling of the effects of pesticides on farm workers was that, at least in relation to birds and to an extent microbes, but that's, you know, not super relevant here. Um, pesticides affect birds and migrant farm workers in the, insofar as, you know, their brains are made up and, you know, their nervous systems are, are made up in the exact same way. Um, and so sort of contrary to Claudia's um, experiences, I found that, and uh, my host Hardy can do a much better job of, of saying this, um, that whatever ends up being, you know, whatever we do for, that's good for birds is going to be good for people and vice versa, whatever we do that's good for people in protecting them from pesticides will be good from birds. And so being able to protect, protect these communities um, from pesticides, there is this clear through line in which if we can protect one, then we can protect many individuals and perhaps many more than just birds and people. Yeah. Thank you for that, Harrison. Um, I, I think that pesticides in particular are one of those ways where the parallels aren't clear enough for people. Um, I, I, we've had conversations around like the reproductive health of migrant farm workers and the reproductive health of um, birds, the latter being so well explored in Silent Spring so many decades ago by Rachel Carson, um, and the former still not well enough um, articulated. Uh, another book I read during college, Our Stolen Future, so old now, um, so underrepresented in, in, the, in the public awareness. Um, I, I think these projects are a great way to make some of those connections. Um, Javier, I'll go to you next. Um, one thought about the research you did or the partners you met, um, or one insight from thinking about Bird City. Wow, yeah, one insight. Uh, there's many insights. Um, in this question, I struggle to pick my favorite, but just so folks know a little bit more context about Bird City. So Bird City is a recognition, it's a conservation action, conservation recognition program based on actions uh, that acknowledges communities that get together to work for birds around four action groups, which is, uh, which are, um, ecosystem uh, preservation or habitat creation, rather, um, sustainability, uh, outreach, and reduction of threats. So basically folks get together, they meet and prove a couple of a set of actions they take, and the program recognizes them 
as a bird city city or town or location or whatever the name of the locality is so um what i did was to look at the program as it as it is set up and to ponder how justice and equity uh, topics would fit um into their framework so i guess um again it's hard to pick a single highlight but i guess it's what keeps coming to me are are are, are two maybe one is across the board, and I reflect on this, but with also reflecting on my job, because there's two things that I did in parallel. So a lot of the conversations within the nonprofit sector echo uh, from, from one sector to another. And I guess one of those highlights is basically the struggle to get funded and to fund people's work, um, which to me goes to the question of, well, where is the, where is capital? Where is the money? And in general, in society, we have a problem of funding stuff so we have a problem of wealth being hoarded somewhere and it not going to where it is needed right so that is one highlight that i keep seeing throughout both my work and also the fellowship which is where the question uh, was about right that's one thing and then the other is a thing that keeps keeps coming up for me it's this notion that for folks particularly in the justice uh, realm of things uh, we do approach conservation itself as if from a different country in my case i am from a different country and speak a different language uh but it's this notion of approaching conservation from a entirely different worldview and from an entirely different set of values from that of traditional conservation and i think that's something that needs to be acknowledged more because it's what people come into conversations with. And often that is what keeps people from understanding each other. Uh, and one comes to realize after a while that, oh, we're speaking a different language but using the same words because we're seeing all this very differently. So that's that's the other big highlight that we can certainly keep talking about and dissecting in many instances, but those two, funding and language and, and, and worldviews. And translation too, um, translation exactly, yes. <laughs> um, even within, as you're saying, within the same language. We we might be using the same language, um, but but saying very different things. Um, I I think one of the what you talked about in terms of concentrations of wealth is absolutely central. Um, it, it conservation doesn't get much money at all compared to what what is needed what we need to protect birds um, environmental justice or social justice efforts especially indigenous led conservation efforts um, uh, it, 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 the smaller the group the less money and power often um, environmental justice organizations tend to be very small local conservation organizations local environmental education organizations tend to be very small um, so how how can we bring more people in, but also more funding in over time? Um, how do we transform the system so that those who heal the earth, care for the earth, care for people, um, have more resources to work with and don't burn out? Uh, those are some of the big questions that we've grappled with in the fellowship program. Um, and also, how, how do we show off why we care and how we care more? Um, I think visual art is a great way to do that. Poetry is a great way to do that, but also sh showcasing how different groups of people have cared for their home places is, is another way. Um, Claudia, any insights from your project is a toolkit. Um, how do how does that? Um, you just tell me a little bit more about that toolkit that you were working on. Um, yeah, so I was working with the Alliance for Zero Extinction. So the idea is that um, they're going to do this work in different places in Latin America to make sure that uh, certain species of birds are not going extinct from these places. Um, so they're working with local nations and what my project was is trying to bring in um, more women into this initiative. So these projects that are very local to um, places where birds are going extinct. Um, so it was it was hard because I think 
uh, there's so much literature already on gender equality and how to bring women um, into the conversation. Um, and so I think it was hard because the, the projects are already sort of a structure in some way. So what I was trying to do is kind of bring that piece into what the projects are already doing. Uh, so that's how this toolkit came about. So one of the things that we wanted to do is not put more work into the organizations that um, are going to be part of this program, because they already have a lot of uh, things that they have to manage to make sure that these projects are completed. So um, I think the challenge with the toolkit was trying to make sure that they had uh, the, the essential tools in one page um, that they needed to start thinking about gender equality. And so that, that was uh, sort of tough to kind of narrow down how do you um, just give a, a one page uh, toolkit to a lot of communities? Like you mentioned at the beginning, each community is different, each location is different. So how do you guide uh, this organization that I haven't never met um, to go through that process of start thinking about gender equality? Um, I think my takeaway from that uh, is that no matter what the process is later on, there's so many steps when it comes to including women in programs in general, um, and whether it's in bird conservation or any conservation. But I think what I, uh, my biggest takeaway was just that it's very important that at the beginning, uh, organizations understand intersectionality of women. Um, in whatever location they're doing their work. Because if they don't understand that, then, then I, some people or some women that I interview in different places in Latin America kept saying this, uh, we do get women to participate in our programs, uh, but we're not getting the women that we want to come to our programs. Um, so I think it's very important for any, any initiative, whether it's conservation of birds or any conservation, program to make sure that they understand um, the local women or the women that are they trying to engage because they're all different, like you mentioned now. Um, they all have uh, different backgrounds and stories. And so it's I know it's really hard to try to, you know, in a project to incorporate all that, but um, thinking about those things can really make a difference because if you're working with a community and you use the same template that you use in another place with that community, then women are not going to respond to that because it's not their experience, um, it's not their background. So I think after once you understand your community and the intersectionality of women in that community, then you know, you can move on to the next steps. Uh, but to me, that's the essential part of starting a project that really thinks about gender equality. Thank you, Claudia. Um, yeah, there's so much complexity in all of this that uh, and context dependence that it is hard to talk generally about it. It's often easier to talk about a specific place or a specific example. Um, Swapna, your um, one of the other ways in which your project was different is that as as the other fellows were interviewing community partners or ABC staff, you were interviewing the fellows themselves about their projects and research, and so got glimpses of what everyone was doing. Um, what's key? What's one key insight that you took away from those conversations? Um. I think the one key insight for me was that um, we do need um, community engagement. And uh, that's where the art comes in. In my experience, uh, I have actually um, exhibited around Austin, Texas, not just in art festivals, but in non-traditional venues like the Writers Festival where we got the most response. I was just there to, uh, I exhibited my prints, but, and that drew people in. But then I had information on each of the species I had painted. So while they were looking at the art, they were interested and curious why I had painted that. And then I was able to talk about that. 
Uh, so, uh, so a person who may not uh, normally think very deeply about conservation was, uh, uh, it got maybe at least a few thinking about it. Um, I, at the same time, I had actually even make, made uh, small cards with a print, uh, a, a photo of the uh, painting on those cards and a little information about the species. So it could be used like a bookmark. And that was, I was just, it was just a giveaway. So uh, people loved that and there was, there was a, a lot of interaction from that. Um, another thing that um, was really exciting for this was uh, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Uh, Jacqueline Stollard uh, is working with us and uh, she is, um, it, uh, you know, Sustainable Forestry Initiative is for, is working for ensuring the health of forests. So uh, they are using the paintings for their conservation programs. So it is my hope that um, there is more community engagement from especially students from underserved communities and other people who may not uh, normally uh, have access to this kind of art or uh, information on conservation. And so we will have, we will spread the message a little bit more and um, yeah, that's it. So we'll have diversity in uh, thoughts and uh, interactions with people. Thank you, Swapna. I have one more question for you, but just wanted to also mention what, what Swapna is talking about is this Together for Birds activity collection that we've been developing with Project Learning Tree um, for elementary age students. And there'll be a webinar about that work um, sometime later, but we're thinking of putting a pullout, we're going to put a um, pullout poster of Swapna's art within that activity collection for classrooms or for people to, to have. Um, and also some there were there are a couple of snippets of um noah gomes's work in there as well we hope to embed the work that fellows do in the work that abc does more broadly over time um amy upgren just put something in the chat about the gender tool toolkit and how that'll be used for alliance for zero extinction site conservation um there's all these possibilities going forward um swapna one quick question about the process you use different media for different um different birds and different projects um can you talk about the process of going from an interview with a fellow to a finished piece of art yeah uh first of all that was uh, because i had very good supervisors like namal and uh, lynn Meekham. both of them met with me uh throughout the uh, fellowship so first in the beginning when i was meeting with fellows and I was listening to all these different fellowships and ideas. Uh, it was not coalescing in the beginning, but I, attend, I kept attending the meetings till we figure. And then Namal uh, really encouraged me to uh, try different media, even the ones I normally don't use. So uh, not just oils, but then we try. I tried uh, even markers, markers for one, uh, watercolor pencils, pastels. So we tried it, all kinds of different media. Um, it was. Uh, I actually was with the help of the fellows and their supervisor, we were able to uh, narrow down the species that might be best representative of each one, uh, each of the fellows. So it was not going too far away from the birds, which is our focus. And yet, uh, for example, the grassland project uh, with uh, um, uh, Amy, uh, she was, uh, she gave us the uh, species of the bobwhite quail, which uh, is uh, representative of um, their culture of the Choctaws, uh, which she is part of that um, uh, heritage. So that was very exciting. I had never seen, I knew about the bobwhite quail and the conservation status of it, but then I didn't know about the connection. So that was very exciting to see that. And so we did that for the others, like the... Um, uh, the acorn woodpecker for the California project. Uh, uh, I think we did the chimney swift for the bird city engagement Javier's project, uh, so and so on. So uh, I would um, I would say it was just it was just like a swirl of ideas, and then uh, the one anchoring point was the species. And then, uh, but then I had the freedom of expressing myself with different media. Thank you, Swapna. So one other quick question from me, and then I'm going to bring Jordan back in to ask some audience questions, um, questions submitted by people who are part of this um, webinar. 
a quick question. And I will start with Claudia first this time, or no, Javier first this time. I'm trying to switch it around. Something hopeful that you'll take on to what you do next. Wow. Um, I think something hopeful, uh, youth. Um, I, I keep finding hope in young folks uh, uh, across the board uh, in all places. And in Jews in particular, and across the board also, the, the willingness to change. Um, I think it's something I always, I, not always, but often see, and I certainly saw it here, that even if we are not reaching understanding about histories or words or terminologies or what conservation even means, there is a willingness to change and a recognition that that we need to change a lot of stuff. So that gives me a little bit of hope because if I disappear tomorrow, I know that folks are gonna continue the path towards change. So yeah, keeping it going and, and continuing to build on what's been being yep. done in the past. Thank you. Harrison. Yeah, so I'll echo what Javier said um, and add to it that the innovative capabilities of connections um, is something that I really am inspired by just within my own work, you know, thinking about how groups like ABC can now partner with farm workers um, or farm worker advocacy groups. These are not communities that would, you know, historically we would bring together in the same spaces. And now as our world becomes, you know, more deeply connected and we're thinking about new ways to protect the planet and protect its communities, you know, folks are utilizing their, their openness to find new ways to bridge knowledge bases, um, whether it's, you know, positivist, not, uh, you know, knowledge bases, things that need to be proven or alternative, non-tradition, non-Western knowledge bases. Uh, you know, to bring about a new way of thinking about this so that, as Javier says, I can feel more and more redundant in the work that I do and thinking about people that are constantly doing things, which allows more openness and more freedom to me for, you know, to get weird with the things that I do throughout the, you know, the remainder of my career. I think weirdness and leaning into that is definitely a goal for me as well. Um, the connections is a hugely important piece. Um, connections between ideas, but also bringing new partners and new partnerships to ABC to expand and enrich um, the work that we do. It's, it's not so much about pulling up more seats to the table, but expanding the table itself um, and sitting at other people's tables too. Um, there's, there's so many possibilities inherent in connection and so much more to explore. Um, Swapna something hopeful that you'll take on into what you do next? Um, this is something I had thought of uh, a little while ago, but it really, um, I, I feel the expediency of it now. Uh, I think uh, that I want to participate in something like uh, installations, not just exhibiting the art itself, but making it a completely immersive experience uh, because I have had uh, the chance to go to the rainforest and a lot of my paintings are from there. Also duck species from all over the United States. Uh, I would like to have a installation where we have, uh, where people can have like the tactile experience, uh, uh, list, watching a video from there, listening uh, to sounds of the rain which surrounds you while you're looking at the art itself. So it's a completely immersive experience. And, uh, something that will uh, hopefully stay with people and they fall in love and then value this thing uh, to conserve it and somehow participate in the Thank future. Thank you, Swapna. Yeah, multi-sensory experience, whether you're out in a forest, diving in the ocean, um, or, or visiting an art gallery is such an important piece of this. Claudia, could you wrap us up with one hopeful thing from this experience that you'll carry forward? Um, I have to agree with Javier and uh, with Harrison and Swapna. Um, I'm hopeful because I see how many, there's so many people working on different conservation issues and there's so many like that's 
I mean, that's just been my career for the past uh, six years, and there are so many things that need to be fixed and addressed. Um, and sometimes it gets overwhelming, but knowing that nonprofits and uh, government organizations, um, they're all trying to do their part in some way or another, whether they're perfect or not, it's something else, but they're doing their best um, and, and trying to work on, on solving some of these issues. And specifically gender equality, the same thing, like it, we still have a lot of issues, especially in Latin America, women are still uh, not being 100% um, included in a lot of conversations. And there's so many violence against women and, and, um, and things like that. But I think just knowing that people are working on the issue and that you know they're, they still have hope for change, I think is encouraging. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I, I think the togetherness piece of it is really important. Um, there was, Jordan, um, I'll turn it over to you, but there was one question in the Q&A um, about a representative day um, in the life of a fellow. I think we'll be able to capture more of that in the written posts. It's really tough to do uh, um, in, in uh, the confines of this small time period that we have together. But um, very quickly, they did a lot of interviews of partners, um, uh, a lot of reaching out and learning about potential partner organizations, um, current ABC partners, but also potential future partners, um, a lot of digging into the research around their specific topic, um, and a lot of learning together with their project hosts. We also met monthly as a group, as a cohort. They also had check-in meetings with me once a month individually. Um, that's a very quick snapshot of what they were up to, but Jordan, over to you. No, I I feel bad. I, I have to cut the conversation off. The time has flown by and I'm so grateful to all of our fellows for both participating today, but also all of the work that you did in your fellowships. Um, before we finally wrap up, Namal, I do want to give you the opportunity to just say, you know, one more thing about the program overall and what you would like for folks to really resonate or hold on to as they as they go and tell friends about this. Thank you, Jordan. The one thing is that there just are so many ways of knowing a place, a bird species. Um, so many different ways of thinking about why we should work for birds, why we should work to help people thrive in the places where birds are abundant or um, or to help people restore bird populations. Um, yeah, the, the, the myriad connections and ways of knowing. Wonderful. So yeah, unfortunately, we have to wrap up now. And there is one final question. And I'd love for all of the fellows again to answer it. So that question is, what is the, not about your fellowship, not about the program, but just for right now, what is one thing you would love for everyone watching this webinar to take away and go tell a friend? And so Claudia, would you like to start? Um, I think just to whenever you're doing any program, um, whether it's conservation or just community based um, to just make sure to get to know the communities that you're working with and make sure that um, voices that are being marginalized uh, get into be part of the conversation. Um, so thinking outside of the box of like what you might uh, be thought about. Uh, in the past and just trying to think a little bit outside of the box and to know those communities uh, when you're planning projects and um, doing efforts to make sure that you are including those, whether it's women or indigenous women or uh, any marginalized community. Thank you, Claudia. Harrison, do you wanna go? Yeah, I think uh, one big takeaway um, that I can pass along from this uh would be you know food is such a crucial tool i think or such a cr crucial vehicle um for creating the kinds of connections that can whether it's gardening or preparing the food sharing a meal um composting whatever waste you know that that comes out of it can be so valuable for bringing people together and helping them 
ground themselves in what it is that, you know, their community is about, the communities that they may not, you know, know of, uh, that they're sharing the space with may be about, and how we can all come together to serve one another. I can't claim that that's something from Namal's story. Folks will have to read that to learn more about how we can save ourselves to serve the communities of our beautiful, diverse planet. That's wonderful, Harrison. And Javier. Yeah, now I, uh, Claudia and Harrison just, just laid two very important elements down very beautifully. And I, I, I don't want to repeat what they just said. So I would just detail what both of them said. So thank you for going through me for the round, though. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Swapna? Again. Okay, I'll, I'll just wrap it up. I, the thing that comes to my mind is a verse from the Vedas. It says, Yatha Drishti, Tatha Shrishti, which is Drishti is your outlook and Srishti is the world. Your outlook determines the world. So if we un really understand something, we uh, love and value it, we, then the effort to conserve it will come naturally. That's wonderful, Swapna. Thank you. And Namal? I think that's a perfect ending. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much again to all of you. We're so grateful again to have you here today and all of the work that you've done here at ABC. Um, unfortunately, we have to end the webinar though. So thank you to our audience as well for joining us. We couldn't do our work without you and your support. So with that, good birding and have a great day.